My name is Sebastian Stodolak, and this is the first uh, of hopefully many video talks on free markets and liberty that Warsaw Enterprise Institute will publish here on social media. Our today's guest is, I think, one of the most recognizable libertarian thinker these days, Mr. Jeffrey Tucker. He is the editorial director of the American Institute for Economic Research and author of many, many eye-opening books and articles and a fervent promoter of classical liberalism. Nice to have you with us, Mr. That's Tucker. nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Let's go straight to the point. Okay. You just published a new book with a telling title, Liberty or Lockdown. So what of those two do you choose and why? Now, I favor liberty over lockdown. I'm very worried about this new ideology that when a new pathogen comes along or when anything comes along, we should immediately impose dictatorships, lock people in the home, shut down their businesses, close the schools, prevent people from gathering, destroy industry after industry after industry, and then even nationalize the hospitals. Um, this the, and, and shut down trade and shut down travel. Um, I, it, to me, it's the last six months have been or seven months have been an absolute nightmare in central planning, and I think it's been a disaster for disease mitigation. It's not done anything for for the disease. The countries that didn't lock down, like Sweden, um, are now functioning uh, normally. Or Tanzania was another one. Uh, South Dakota was another one. The countries that never locked down are got rid of the virus through herd immunity strategies, not strategies, through herd immunity, herd immunity phenomenon. <clears throat> the countries that did lock down are still dealing with all kinds of problems. Plus, they ruined their economies. Okay. But at the beginning of this pandemic, we did not know the nature of the new virus. Wasn't it then a reasonable strategy to freeze things up and wait until we'd know a bit more? Uh, well, I think it's uh, hugely unscientific and mistaken to act in the absence of evidence. If we didn't know enough, then we shouldn't have destroyed people's rights and overthrown 500 years of legal tradition. John Ioannidis from Stanford University wrote, I think sometime in uh, about March 8th, maybe March 10th, that we're about to engage in a catastrophic social experiment without any evidence to back it up. And he did cite certain evidence from the Diamond Princess uh, cruise liner and from the uh, NBA and a few other places, from Wuhan, uh, that this virus was going to be very widespread, but ultimately very mild for everyone except for the extremely vulnerable populations, the old and unhealthy populations. And that uh, the idea that we would overthrow everything we believe about human rights with a lack of evidence that this thing was actually anything remotely as close to something like Ebola uh, was was a, a gigantic error. In fact, so I, let's, I don't let's, even... let's let's assume uh, let's assume we are in the jungle, and somebody is screaming tiger or a snake, or any other animal that can endanger your life. Would you say no? I will not run because I do not have uh, credible scientific evidence, or would you just run in case? Well, I would say if it's CNN telling us that the tiger is coming, I would not <laughs> I wouldn't do anything. <laughs> it depends it wasn't on the only CNN. It wasn't only CNN. Everybody yeah. around us were telling us, run. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of that was echoed in you know, the media. And the media loves this stuff. Um, in the United States, we have certain areas of the country that are, uh, that are uh, right next to the oceans, you know? Um, um, the houses, houses and whole communities that are very vulnerable to hurricanes. And during hurricane season, the media is always screaming, this is the worst hurricane ever, the worst thing, you can't believe it, how terrible it is, because they want you to stay watching them and getting really scared. Uh, but after a couple of seasons and living in these areas, you start to learn this and then you end up not, uh, not going along. Like we have to realize that a lot of times these threats are wildly overblown and certain that's been true with COVID-19. Do you think that the the lockdown was the reason for economic recession that is the reality today? Yes, absolutely. You know, um, I understand that movements, people were restricting their movements in the early day, early uh, period, like late February and the first couple of weeks of March, because they feared both the virus and also the response to the virus. I, I myself was um, on my way to two Broadway shows on March 12th in New York. I went to New York and I came back. I, was, I had a hotel there, but I came back on the train because I was actually afraid 
because I knew government had this power, that they would stop the train and quarantine us all and put us all in a big holding cell. I mean, I, I mean, that didn't happen, but that's what I was afraid of. I was afraid way more of, of the uh, government response than, than the virus itself, because I was looking at what the scientists were saying at the time. But, and, but, but it is, I'm sorry to say, mm -hmm. but it was just you. So it is kind of an anecdotal evidence. And when you look into the statistics of consumption or of production, then you'd see uh, that the real decline in people's economic activ activity happened before the formal lockdowns and it yes. was kind of a um, homogeneous through all the society the, the, this phenomenon right. um well, so yes. that would suggest that the lockdowns were somewhat redundant but also not a big deal recessions would have happened anyway lockdown or not mm. isn't it the case I, that's a very difficult kind of factual problem it's true that people restricted their movements canceled dinner reservations stopped travel in the first two weeks of march uh, but that was, there were two motivations there. One was fear of the virus, yes. And, but there was also fear of, of what government was going to do about the virus. So it's really difficult to untangle those things. But here's the critical thing. Probably people would have already corrected their behavior by late March and gone back to living life normally. Uh, once the lockdowns happen, now you have a problem. Now people didn't have a choice. They had to stay in their homes. Uh, they had to shut their businesses. They couldn't even go to church on Easter Sunday and so on and so on. So it became crazy. Like once, here's the problem. Once government has a policy in place, society is not even allowed to respond. So you might be right that there would have been a, a temporary restriction in people's movements and spending habits, that sort of thing. But it would have it would have corrected itself very quickly once the data were in about the demographics, about the viruses. But by the time... Uh, the, the demographics uh, data was available to everybody, you didn't have a choice because everything was already locked down. So I think society would have very quickly adapted and we would have gone back on economic recovery very, very quickly, like a so-called V-shaped uh, recovery mm -hmm. would have happened mm -hmm. already. And also, if we had let the virus um, spread, um, in a normal way, in a rational way, among the non-vulnerable population, which is to say, continue to allow mass events, allow concerts, allow Broadway, allow movies, restaurants, everything to happen, then we would have achieved herd immunity already um, uh, five months ago, at least in the Northeast of the United States, which we probably mm -hmm. did anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but instead, the idea of curve flattening, uh, all that's just a way of prolonging the pain. It doesn't make the virus go away. Uh, the volume of the curves are, is exactly the same. So instead of getting herd immunity right away, we spread out the infection. Maybe I don't know for sure this is happened. We might have spread out the infection longer and just and just caused more suffering. Mm -hmm. But well, I heard a lot of libertarians arguing that actual lockdowns could be reconciled with liberty thanks to the non-aggression principle. So mm -hmm. if there is a risk, you could infect somebody with a dangerous virus. And if you are aware of this risk, you should limit your contacts with others unless you are sure you are healthy. So what's so incorrect about <clears throat> that kind of reasoning? Well, the problem with it, uh, applying an abstract philosophical principle to a scientific uh, empirical matter is that you could be wrong. What you know? What if suddenly uh, people came to believe that lemons were extremely dangerous, and and so and so if you carry a lemon on a, on a boat, that uh, you're possibly going to infect everybody. Then the libertarians come along and say, "See, nobody should carry lemons because that violates the non-aggression principle." You see the problem. It turns out lemons actually are very important on boats because you want you you want to not get scurvy, right? And it's a similar thing to with viruses. We have immune systems that absolutely have to adapt to the latest pathogens. That's been true for a million years of human evolution. The immune system gets stronger. Capitalism has been great for immune systems because we have more and more contact with each other, more and more trade. We get more and more exposure. So in other words, it could be that getting exposed to the virus is, is uh, some, something that's benevolence. And, I, I would, could even go further. Sunetra Gupta at uh, Oxford University has says that you have an obligation as a, as a member of non-vulnerable population to get the virus so that you can contribute to herd immunity. I think she goes too far, but, but she makes the point that's basically the opposite of the point you're making, that it's not aggression to give the virus. It might be a gift. Yeah, well, 
let's think of other virus. Let's think of Ebola. E Ebola as a gift, that sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah, that's true enough. So one of the things you notice about viruses, and again, all of this is caught up with the science. This is very difficult to just like sit in an armchair with a, with a, with a simple philosophy and, and figure all this stuff out. Uh, the empirical record of viruses is that there's an inverse relationship between prevalence and severity. So a really bad virus like Ebola, it can it kills, but, but then it dies and goes away. So th there was a case in, I think it was uh, Nigeria about 15 years ago where uh, Ebola came to a tire plant and uh, a private uh, tire plant and they immediately quarantined everybody you know, and, and try to protect people who were vulnerable. Still some people died, but the remainder of the community was protected from, from Ebola. And then, and then the virus went away. That's how something like a very stupid virus like Ebola works. It kills quickly, but then it dies. Uh, the virus has to have a host in order to continue to spread and live. If it kills the host, then it dies very quickly. That's the complicated uh, evolutionary history of viruses. It so happens with COVID-19 that it's a mild virus that is very smart. So it spreads and spreads and spreads because it doesn't kill uh, the host unless the person has, has basically no functioning immune system at all. Which raises- Mr. Tucker, yeah. Mr. Tucker, do you wear a mask, a face mask, obviously? I, I do if, if, uh, if, um, if it contributes to social peace. In other words, I don't like it, but if there's a law that requires me to, or if I'm going to be facing some screaming person who's going to hurt my feelings, <laughs> which happens, <laughs> I will definitely wear a mask. Neither of us is the virusologist or epidemiologist, but right. we are all experts in everyday life decision-making, right? So right. face mask is one of those choices we have to make these days. And Nasib Taleb, uh, probably you know the guy, author of Black Swan, thinker that considers himself a libertarian, uh, says that one should use the masks, whether he likes it or not, since it is a low cost solution to the problem. He writes that even though it might not be worth it from the perspective of individual, because the reduction of the probability that you will get infected due to the mask is very small, is marginal, but collectively, it really helps to reduce transmission by the law of probabilities. So if it's cheap and effective, why should we oppose ma face masks? The problem with Nassim Tlaib's analysis here is, is there's two big problems with it. One is it's only one single va variable he's considering, which is transmission. There are other downsides to mask wearing. One is that it's very cruel for people who have a difficulty hearing. Um, it's depersonalizing. It's taking away people's humanity. The face is very much part of how we see each other, interact with each other, and feel sympathy towards each other. You got everybody in a mask. You've probably noticed people get mean and they get social alienated from uh, from others and and it ruins social life and and it can be very very cool and and for people who suffer from asthma and other health difficulties mask mandates uh, are actually diminishing their health so and in fact I think you know I, I have a friend of mine who's 80 years old he said he said he refuses to wear a mask because as he has an 80 year old man he has to use his nose to breathe <laughs> so this is true <laughs> so Nassim is only considering one one var variable among thousands, which is the spread of, spread of the pathogen. The other problem with his analysis is that he hasn't read a basic book on cell biology that you can get from Amazon. And, and what you learn from that is that um, spread the, the spread of the disease is may, uh, may be the solution, not the problem. He's just thinking about it in a very crude way, as if uh, every virus is like leprosy or uh, Ebola or something like that. Not all viruses are that way. Some viruses you should get to, to bolster your immune system. And that's how you make a contribution to protecting the vulnerable. Because under, under herd immunity, if, if enough people get the virus, then the, then the R0 falls below uh, the level at which it, it can continues to spread and the virus comes under control. And then the vulnerable populations that have been locked down and afraid to go out can then come out and resume their normal functioning lives. So um, this idea of suppression is very cruel and, 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 and might in fact be immoral. Mm -hmm. So, but one thing is for certain, uh, the present scientific uh, research uh, says that the uh, mortality or fatality of uh, the coronavirus is um, higher and is significantly higher than the seasonal flu. And with that knowledge, going back to January 2020, um, what would you suggest to do? 
if not mm. no lockdown were to be considered what else should we do to prevent the spread of pandemic well, well first i'll cor correct your, your your claim that the uh, infection fatality rate <coughs> is um, higher than seasonal flu because we don't know the infection fatality rate there are estimates of it um, uh, we certainly don't know the case fatality rate there are estimates but but they keep changing every single day and the latest figures from the center for disease control match what we know in, in wuhan and spain and italy and sweden which is that for people who healthy people under the age of 70 it's actually far less severe than seasonal flu so it's you have to have a heterogeneous understanding of the population this is the big problem with all these models um, is that they all assume homogeneous risk among everybody. They assume that everybody's equally at risk to getting the disease and dying. That is emphatically not the case. Okay. And once you introduce heterogeneity to these models, um, the, the, the uh, case fatality rate that you can project from them is, is something like uh, a mere 8% of what they claim are going to be dead. So instead, instead of three and a half million people dying, you're going to get 250,000 people dying once you introduce a, a heterogeneity of the population into the models. So did so, I answer your question? You, no, I answered a no, different no. question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I, I was asking about the oh, no, opti okay. the optimal strategy for, for okay. and, fighting the pandemic. Yeah, and this is a very important uh, question because we need to start thinking about that as humane liberal libertarians. You know, what is it we're supposed to do in, when a panic comes? And I would just quote the words of Donald A. Henderson. He's the eradicator of smallpox who headed the World Health Organization for something like 25 years and, and is responsible for the only eradication we have, actually, um, in modern times, uh, the, the India of smallpox, which is a wicked, wicked disease. What he says is that in the event of a new pathogen in the community, in the absence of a vaccine, the most important priority is to maintain normal social functioning so that we can make rational, reasonable decisions to protect the vulnerable populations um, and get to herd immunity as fast as possible and not destroy people's lives and liberties and human rights. Okay, but would that mean that we should do nothing? Uh, no, I think, well, uh, for 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 90 99% of the population we should do nothing it's only the 99.8% uh, that a tiny uh, uh, people beyond that it's a very tiny sliver of the population that need to protect themselves and that's something that got, government doesn't need to do this long term care facilities can do this on their own elderly people who are who are lacking in strong immune systems have known for decades to avoid large crowds and flu seasons so that society contains within itself the capacity to manage uh, new pathogens because people are, are more or less wise. They're certainly smarter than governments, right? Because governments, once you put them in charge, they put COVID-19 patients in long-term care facilities in New York and killed tens of thousands of people. So it would have been way better for government to do absolutely nothing and let people uh, figure out a wise path uh, towards achieving, uh, to, to protecting themselves and, and protecting uh, vulnerable populations. And the best protection uh, from COVID-19 is to get it. 2% of whole US population already had COVID-19. Over 7 million people. So it's, it makes around 2% of all Americans. Are you one of them? Oh, have I ever had it? Yeah. Well, I realized back in February that I needed to get it. And so I've been trying to get it for many, many months, but I've not been tested. <clears throat> and of course, like we all have symptoms. You think maybe I have it, maybe I don't. It's a dry cough. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the part of the problem, and I, I'm really happy to get tested. I really do hope that I've been exposed. I've been trying to get exposed uh, for, for a very long time. Part of the problem is that our, uh, our tools for uh, the PCR testing, you, you know, are very unstable. You, you can't, there's a lot of false positives in these things. You can't know if it's all, it depends on the cycle rate at which you set the test. And the other problem is that even if you test positive for COVID, you can't be sure that the symptoms you have are traceable to COVID itself. I mean, this happened to my, my sweet dear brother. It was very interesting. He got sick and he got a COVID positive test. Nine days later, he called me up. He said, this COVID thing is terrible. I said, what are your symptoms? He said, well, I'm still in bed with fever. And I said, my dear brother, 
you are not suffering from COVID. You have something else. Get back to the doctor. So he went back to the doctor and the doctor tested him again. He tested negative for COVID. And he said, my God, man, you've got a wicked sinus infection. Here's some antibiotics. Next day he was cured. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know whether he should be happy considering <laughs> what you just said in your interview or said. Thank right. you very much, Mr. Tucker, for finding time for the short but very informative interview. Stay safe, write some more books, and I hope we would have a chance to chat again someday in the future. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you.